Good evening and welcome to beautiful downtown Burlington. My name is Carrie and I'm the assistant manager here at Phoenix Books. Um, tonight we have the Tonight we welcome two authors in celebration of their new short story collections. Megan Mayhew Bergman is the author of Almost Famous Women and Birds of a Lesser Paradise. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, The Best American Short Stories, New Stories from the South, McSweeney's, Tin House, and Oxford American, among other publications. She lives on a small farm in Vermont with her veterinarian husband, two daughters, and many animals. And Rebecca Mackay is the author of the acclaimed novels The Hundred Year House and The Borrower, an Indie Next Pick, an O Magazine Fall Reading Selection, a Booklist Top 10 Debut, and one of Chicago Magazine's choices for Best Fiction of 2011. Her work has appeared in many publications, um, including the Best American Short Stories, Best American Non-Required Reading, Harper's, McSweeney's, Tin House, and many more. Um, her newest book is Music for Wartime, a collection of short stories, and she lives here some of the year, and outside of Chicago with her husband and two daughters. So without further ado, I give you our authors. Thank you. Who do you want to go first? Oh. We haven't talked about that? Hmm. You're already up there. Do you want to go first? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read and then we'll talk? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. Every short story author loves a fan or two. <laughs> I'm going to start, I'm just going to read two very short stories. There's, the stories vary in length in my book, Almost Famous Women. It was written about real women who actually existed, mostly on the fringe of fame. It's a little bit on a meditation on the power and impact of fame, but also women who were living passionately and, and um, non-traditional lives. I thought I would do my story about Beryl Markham because Paula McLean's book on Beryl Markham I think comes out this week, so I thought that would be a nice thing to do. And then I've got another very short story called The Internees that I'll read. This is a picture of Beryl Markham. She wrote the memoir West with the Night. It was possibly ghostwritten, probably ghostwritten, but it, she still lived the life and it was a damn interesting one. She was um, a horse trainer, uh, Africa's first certified horse trainer, and also a bush pilot um, in Africa. And I feel like most people often focus on her memoir or her aviation, but I wanted to talk about the horse riding. It's called, it has a really naughty title, it's called A High Grade Bitch Sits Down for Lunch. And that's from a Hemingway quote. Hemingway called her a high grade bitch in a letter. And um, on, there's a blurb on the back of West with the Night, and they just edited out the high grade bitch part, <laughs> which I love. <clears throat> so the pretty part is, but this girl, who is to my knowledge very unpleasant, and we might even say a high grade bitch, can write rings around all of us. And that's Ernest Hemingway on Beryl Markham's memoir. This takes place in Kenya, 1925. The sun was setting over Lake Nakuru peering through lavender clouds to leave a golden trail across the water. Beryl leaned against the brick wall of the stable to watch the lake. The horses were munching their hay and later she'd groom the filly, or maybe she'd ride the stallion out for the first time, the one she'd gotten for nothing at auction a few weeks ago, the one with the perfect bloodline, the one who'd killed a man with his hooves and teeth in the corner of a stall in Nairobi. If the filly was her favorite, the stallion was her hope. She ignored his name because she would give him a new one. She'd give him a new life. He would be reborn into glory on the track and the customers would line up at her door. Why don't you ride him already, she chided herself. You know you can do it. You'll have to do it if you want to make your money back and God knows you need money. Her servant and friend Kibby, who she'd known all her life, told a client yesterday, Mem Sahib is fearless. She's been riding racehorses since she was 11. True, she'd been raised in Nairobi by a father who raced thoroughbreds, managed a troubled farm, and forgot her birthday. True, a horse had picked her up in his mouth when she was seven and thrown her, and she still had the purple scar on her neck. She could throw a spear like the Nandi. She could hunt. She rode a half-broken motorcycle over the vacant, muddy road from Nakuru to Nairobi when she got lonely, after dark, when you could hear the lions. Once, when she had to pee, an elephant rose from the dark brush and startled her. She ran back to the motorcycle with her wet pants not entirely up. You didn't stand down the elephant, Kibby asked when she told him, feigning disbelief. I'm brave, she said, not an imbecile. She poured herself a glass of wine, measuring it because the bottle had to last a week, a week without guests. 
She went back to leaning against the stable. She sipped the wine and watched enormous salmon-colored clouds of flamingos drag their overturned heads across the muddy shallows of Nakuru. Deafening bird life meant a constant stream of shit on the racetrack, but her horses were too well trained to stop and smell it or lick at it the way her dogs did. I want to be alone when I turn the stallion out, she thought, looking for his proud head over the stall door. I want him to know me as his master, his alpha and omega. She drank more wine, eyes back on the sunset. She could see the silhouettes of water buffalo grazing by the lake, followed, she knew, by clouds of black flies and the threat of river blindness. She knew a stable boy who'd poured boiling water down his back to relieve itching caused by the flies. One bite from a fly like that on the stallion's belly and she'd be thrown and broken, left for dead in the ring. Have I had lunch, she wondered, touching her flat stomach. No, she had not. Might as well do it now and call it dinner. Recently divorced and broke, she lived alone in a small white canvas tent underneath the racetrack stands. Her bed was covered in zebra skin. She kept tins of beans next to bottles of wine and boxes of biscuits in a trunk that had once belonged to her father. She never ate much. Meager eating was good for keeping her figure, and her figure was an asset on a horse and in the bedroom. She wanted to look good in clothes and out of them. Cross-legged on the ground, she speared the beans with her fork and took increasingly quick bites. Today is the day to ride the stallion, she thought, and the light won't last forever. She stood up and brushed off her legs. She locked up the dogs. She pulled her hair away from her face. She took her riding crop from the corner of the tent. She'd always been a cruel person. She knew that, and today it was in her favor. Savage practicality and courage had been bred into her and facing down a beast of a horse in the last hour of light. She could use that. Beryl is easily bored, people said. It was true. She was hungry to feel something every day, and fear is what she felt pulling open the stall door. She relished the feeling, the goose pimples on her arms, her heightened sense of awareness, her singular focus. I will have you, she thought, locking eyes with the regal horse. The stallion was 17 hands high. She could sense the energy he'd built up behind the stall door. She led him to the cross ties and put on his tack carefully, firmly. He swung his head toward her, and she met his face with her elbow. He did it again, and again she met him with her elbow. He balked at the bit and began to pull back, but she waited him out, pressing her thumb into the corner of his mouth, and got it in. She led him to the ring, careful not to look back, not to show fear. She was the leader, and he should follow. She walked the ring and then had him canter and trot. His muscles excited her. They showed potential. They would make her a winner. Holding onto his lead line, she walked closer to his face. Back up, she said. He didn't. She pressed his broad chest until he moved. Back up. She leaned into his back legs to make one cross over the other, the way his mother would have done in the paddock when he was young. You're stronger than I am, she said calmly, but I'm more determined than you. Throw me and I'll get back on. I'll whip you raw. <clears throat> they could say what they wanted to about her in town. They could say she was a bad wife too young. They could say she was cruel. She had a stable all to herself in the evenings and wasn't that better than watching your sad sack of a husband drink himself stupid, fighting him off. Yes, the empty stable was better, even if it meant being unable to buy new clothes, even if it meant buying your own horses, the dangerous ones you could afford, the ones who'd been passed over, written off. Don't let your mind wander, she reminded herself, not even for a second. She led the stallion to the mounting block. He shifted as she gripped his mane and swung her leg over him. What man would ever be more exciting than this, she thought, squeezing the horse between her strong thighs. You will respect me, she said, as he began to turn without her cue. His body stiffened, and his head began to dip. He was going to try to throw her. She could feel it. The battle of wills was real, and she would win, and she would give herself fully. This moment was falling in love. So that's Beryl's story. <clears throat> and I'm going to close by reading a very short story. It's one and a half pages. And it's called The Internees. And I felt the inspiration to write this story when I was researching a nonfiction article on feminists and makeup. And came across an anecdote um, by a lieutenant in the 1945 liberation of Bergen Belsen. And this is what he wrote. <clears throat> At last, someone had done something to make them individuals again. They were someone, no longer merely the number tattooed on the arm. 
the internees, Bergen Belsen, 1945. We would be famous in an ugly way. We would be black and white pictures and textbooks. We would be clavicles and cheekbones and bald heads to learn from. We could smell the bodies of our own kind. We were sitting on lice-infested beds when the British soldiers came, the liberators, the heroes that shuttled us through hastily assembled outdoor showers. They hung sheets on the barbed wire to give us privacy, but modesty was something we'd lost. We walked slowly to and from the showers in striped bathrobes, a pattern none of us could look at later in life without pause and without bowel rising, without fear. They made swings for the children and pushed them into the sky. They deloused us with DDT, spraying it into our hair and underneath our skirts. We sat next to each other on the floor, covered in sores. Some of us were dying of typhus. Some of us were just dying. Some of us drank water and picked through tin cans of food, though we couldn't eat as much as we wanted. Our bodies couldn't take it. We vomited. We sorted through discarded clothes and disintegrating shoes. We made fires. We looked at the five-digit tattoos on our forearms. There was a box of expired lipstick that came off the truck. The British soldiers opened the box and threw tubes of lipstick at the crowd, and we wanted it. We were surprised how badly we wanted it. And we walked the halls, some of us still without adequate clothing, some of us with piss-drenched blankets tossed over our shoulders like shawls with scarlet lips. We rubbed the lipstick over our mouths, over and over. We had pink wax on our rotten teeth, we were human again. We were women. <laughs> Rebecca. <clears throat> so Megan and I were saying before that we kind of matched each other, but now I'm realizing we actually both match our books we like we really <laughs> weirdly well. I <laughs> so, um, and there are seats up here if anyone standing wants to come sit down. Um, okay, so. Um, I was torn between reading you a story about an elephant and reading you a story about a fish, but I feel like I'm going to read you a story about a fish. It's not really about a fish. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to read you half of the story in order to trick you into buying the book, <laughs> and then I'm going to stop in the middle. Um, so um, this is a story from late in the collection. It's actually one of the last stories that I wrote for the collection, too. It's called Good St. Anthony Come Around. The story goes that Chapman, Leaving a meeting in Seattle, this was the 70s, he still designed posters, looked up toward a noise in the sky and got hit in the face with a fish. No one saw, no one pointed and said, Christ, man, that's a fish. But there it was, flailing on the cement. Up in the air, two cormorants still fought loudly. Chapman picked the thing up, a six-incher, cold and dense. He ran with it down the street, shouting at people in his way, dodging bikes around a corner and into a Vietnamese takeout place. Cup of water, he yelled, cup of water. And when the woman didn't understand, he grabbed a cup from the trash and filled it at the soda machine and dropped the fish in head first. Later, he would carry it to the ferry docks in a borrowed bucket and dump it back in the bay. The fish was not doing well and would just be easy prey again, but what was he supposed to do, take it to a vet? My point here isn't that Chapman would do anything to help you out, although that's true. My point is he was the kind of guy stuff happened to. Some people live their whole lives according to the laws of probability. If there's a 1 in 6,000 chance of getting hit by lightning, they won't. They won't win the lottery either, because someone like Chapman will. Someone whose stars made strange and intricate patterns at the moment of his birth. Chapman met Francisco Ling, the same way he met many great artists of the late 80s. He knocked on his door one day and punched him. He'd had the idea over drinks with a friend. I want to punch Keith Haring in the face, he would joked. And the friend had said, do it. <laughs> and somewhere along the way, the idea became serious, became the seed of a great photographic series. Famous and influential artists right after Chapman hit them in the face. Chapman would ring the doorbell, wait for the artist, and punch him square with his right hand, clicking the camera with his left in time to catch the artist's shock, blood, and pain. And if the artist fought back, Chapman kept clicking. He'd explain what he was doing. And if you can believe it, most of the artists understood and forgave him, <laughs> and were even flattered. The series was called Anxiety of Influence. 
And he would patiently explain its Oedipal undertones, its message of forceful reinvention. Aperture ran an article, and Chapman let them publish his herring photo, cowering, bewildered, bloody lip, and the Rauschenberg one, mouth agape, shouting, before the series was even complete. His reputation was made. Was Chapman inspired by that fish hitting him 10 years earlier? Possibly, which is to say we all became aware of the fish incident through the interviews surrounding his eventual solo show. Journalists would ask if he'd ever been surprised like that, if he'd ever been hit in the face, and he'd tell the story. By the time he got to Francisco Ling in 1988, the Aperture article had run. There had been hot debate over Chapman's decision not to hit women, chivalry or a move to exclude them from the canon. And Francisco Ling, looking through his peephole, recognized the guy. He called, I'm sick. You're not hitting me today. <laughs> OK, Chapman said, can we stage something? So Ling opened his door onto the hallway of the Hotel Chelsea and saw the man rocking on his heels. Chapman's beard and flannel shirt did nothing to make him look straight. They were almost an ironic gesture. And his eyes, the way Ling told the story, were wet and brown and strangely apologetic. Perhaps this was because as soon as the door was open wide enough, he swung anyway and hit Ling in the nose. Ling bent double, his mouth filling with blood. The camera clicked and clicked. Ling spat so he wouldn't drool, and then he said, I have AIDS. I know. Check your hand. Check that I didn't cut your hand. Ling would later credit Chapman with not checking his hand at all, with saying, let me get you some ice. Chapman would always maintain that he was just busy shooting the rest of the role. Sometimes the best shots came later, and thinking pragmatically that if he'd cut his hand, noticing sooner wasn't going to make a difference. They wound up on the couch in any event, Ling holding a Ziploc of ice chips to the bridge of his nose. I told you Chapman was the kind of guy things happen to, and maybe what I mean in part is that he let things happen to him, let change wash over him. Because within a week, anyone who dropped by Ling's found Chapman now living there too, moving his stuff from the East Village one cardboard box at a time. Ling threw a party at the end of the month, or really the two of them did, as we discovered when we showed up, wine bottles in hand, the purpose of which was to announce their pairing to the world. It was nice for Ling, we conceded, even those of us who'd last seen Chapman when he hit us in the face, even those who still felt a pulsing in our cheekbones when it rained. Ling's nose was bruised, and when Chapman leaned in to kiss him, we winced. Over canapes and kava, a few of us whispered that we didn't trust Chapman. Keep in mind that we didn't yet know about his years of struggle, his earnest paintings. We feared that his life was a gimmick, that he himself was a gimmick, and we feared he was using Ling to advance his own career. But look at the way they leaned on each other's shoulders. Look at the way Chapman brought Ling his pills and his carrot juice as the party died down. The way he insisted on the couch and the blanket. The way he picked up Ling's cat and held it to his own chest. We sent Junie Kespert in for reconnaissance. Take him for lunch, we said. Find out what his deal is. Find out what he wants. And so Junie invited Chapman to Veselka late that summer. She called us one by one. He's a decent guy, she said. He drinks too much, but who doesn't? I said, a decent guy who punches sick men? He needs to be needed, I think, one of those. But tell me why that isn't perfect for Francisco right now. That right now stuck with me, and I found myself thinking about it later that night in a cab, my eyebrow against the cold window. This would be the last boyfriend Francisco Ling would ever have. We didn't need Chapman to be perfect or even faithful. We just needed him to stick it out. We needed him not to leave Ling on his deathbed. No one was living more than a few years beyond diagnosis those days. I had bought a suit just for funerals. And I'm going to skip ahead now. Um, so um, Ling, who's a really established older artist, is having a, a solo show at the Whitney, which basically everyone understands is going to be his last show. And um, that's pretty much all that's happened. You just have to pretend that you're really invested in Ling by this point, OK, right? So okay, we really care about Ling. Here's what happened. In April, on the night of the Whitney opening, Chapman left Ling at home and headed over early. Ling trusted him to check the lighting, the positioning, to make sure the curator hadn't messed things up overnight. Ling was supposed to take a cab uptown at 8. He was still strong enough to walk out of the building, and he was going to call Junie if he felt too weak. Chapman had helped him dress. It didn't feel odd to arrive before Ling to be greeted by Chapman. 
his beard soft against your cheek, a drink somehow already in your hand, as the sea of patrons and artists swallowed you. The work was extraordinary. What had looked small and half-finished in the apartment, suddenly luminous and monumental. And we were awed, each practicing privately what we'd say to Ling, testing the words on each other first. But the crowd never parted for Ling. The room never hushed. Instead, Chapman breaststroked his way through, sweaty and flushed, and grabbed Junie's arm. You're sure he never called you? A few of us stayed behind and tried Ling's number again and again from the payphones, and a few close friends even remained in the gallery, circulating and keeping things upbeat. But at least 10 of us sardined into cabs and rode back down to 23rd Street, slapping our faces to sober, sober up wondering if we remembered our CPR, wondering if we would have the courage to put our mouths to Ling's. My cab was the second to arrive, and when we got up the stairs and through the door and to the living room, Chapman was on the phone with the police, not the paramedics. And we joined in ransacking what was, aside from the absence of Ling, a normal apartment. Wherever he'd gone, he had taken his essentials, wallet, satchel, toothbrush, his painkillers, but not his AZT not the cat who walked in circles, mewling. What he left behind was a page of shakily written instructions for Chapman, pieces willed to friends, unfinished works to be destroyed. At the bottom, he wrote, at a different slant, an afterthought, I grant Christoph Chapman legal rights to my artistic and physical estate. Please consider this legally valid. It was a warm night, and everything was wet when we set out to blanket the city. I wound up with Junie, who braided and unbraided her hair as we walked. She had me carry her shoes. Junie taught me the prayer that her Catholic grandmother had used when she couldn't find her passport or purse. Good Saint Anthony, come around. Something's lost and can't be found. We chanted it over and over, searching the sidewalks and stoops all the way to Gramercy Park and beyond. I've been using it the rest of my life, and it hasn't brought me much luck, except the few times I've found my car keys when I certainly would have come across them anyway. I looked St. Anthony up years later, expecting him to have found a child in the woods or food in a famine, but all he ever found was his lost psalm book. If that's enough to make you a saint, the reappearance of your book, what then were we, wandering in packs, posting signs outside NYU, not sleeping for three days? Saintly, maybe, if you're generous, but not saints. Sainthood requires divine intervention, or at least the type of luck that passes for it. But we called the Chelsea every two hours till our quarters were gone, and Ling never came home. We kept our eyes open around the city for months, and no one ever saw him. And the story goes on, but that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you. <laughs> Scene change. <laughs> Scene change. <laughs> We're going to talk maybe to each other for a second. Sure, yeah. And then, um, and then open it up. And I have a question for you. Okay. I'm really curious about um, the, do you, did you feel more confident putting together this collection in terms of the editing and ordering stories and putting it into the world? Or was the process of having been published, um, did that make you more nervous the second time because you knew it was out there? It's a good question. I've heard it said that no one is ever more brave than they are with their first book because yeah. you don't know. <laughs> you don't know what it's like to have the anonymous comments on the internet <laughs> or read your Goodreads or Amazon feedback or get a review in the Times um, or what it feels like waiting for that to come out when you know it's coming. Or like the reality that like your aunt is reading it. It's oh, never quite real the absolutely. first time. Absolutely. <laughs> I live in a really small town of Shaftesbury, Vermont. And it's funny, I can always tell who's read my book and who hasn't because the people who haven't read my book often say, Oh, you write children's books. <laughs> like, <laughs> you should open the pages. <laughs> um, yeah, but reading in front of my mom and Raleigh, uh, I grew up in the South, and so I have to admit that sometimes I will choose different stories to read down South. <laughs> you more liberal folks up here. Um, but I, I, I did feel more confident. I think the more you do something, hopefully the better you are. You know, repetition yeah. counts for something. Um, but yeah, there was a, there was a little bit of apprehension of knowing I was a little a little more jaded, perhaps. 
um, but very excited to sneak a second collection into the world. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, it gets to I do mean, that. do you? What do you think? I mean, how do how do publishers feel when you bring a short story collection in? You know? Well, that I mean, <laughs> like the joke is like it's like selling them a bag of dead raccoons. Right, right. Like, Here, <laughs> publish this. Have a story collection. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they actually, I mean, they you know, like with you, like they're putting mm -hmm. it in hardcover. Mm -hmm. They're standing behind it, and not everyone. Um, does that for story collections. So I'm very happy with my press and what they've done with it. But um, it is weird. Like the novels, are, you know, operate at a certain level and you get a certain amount of press coverage and the short stories for a story collection mm -hmm. I'm getting a lot of great coverage, but it's just always going to be like half of what you'd expect for a novel. I um, had somebody come up to me once and say, let me know when you write a real book. <laughs> 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 have you ever That's felt, nice. have you ever felt that? I mean, it's, um, but the, interestingly, I knew Rebecca as a short story writer before I knew her as a novelist because of your best American stories. And so yeah. in my short story world, you were already sort of, you know, a, a really big figure in that. So it's, it's interesting. How do you identify? Yeah, well, no, that's the thing. Like, I feel like this is, you know, people are suddenly like, you know, people who've only read my novels and know me that way suddenly feel like this is a huge shift. And it's like, wait, no, I thought you read all of these first. Like, I didn't really think that. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, like, no, I was writing these, like, really dark, serious short stories. And then I wrote sort of, my novels are dark, but they're maybe funnier than some of my short stories. So it's like, I thought, in my mind, I'm suddenly realizing that I thought everyone knew that about me, which of course they didn't. And mm -hmm. I knew that they didn't really mm -hmm. on, on mm -hmm. the conscious level. Um, but then they're like, oh, these are really dark. And it's like, yes, I've been doing this all along. Where have you been? Why weren't you reading, like, the Kenyon Review Yeah, years yeah. years ago? <laughs> like, come on. Um, but to me, like, that's, you know, that's what's been happening. Um, yeah, and I think that with the first book, too, like, I, it's so funny looking back at, like, this amorphous idea of what I thought publication was the first time. Like, I felt like maybe I would, get a sit, I would sort of sit in a bookstore and sign books. That was, like, a picture in my mind. And then I had this idea of like the book being taught somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that was my entire idea of publication because that was really my idea as a reader of like books are sold in bookstores and they're taught. And I didn't understand really all the other. The hustle? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the, like the, yeah, the like yeah. swim like a shark or you'll die like a shark kind of, yeah. Some people say that you can explore edgier topics and edgier female protagonists in short fiction yeah. than in a novel. What do you, what do you think about yeah. that? Well, I think you can also, like you can maintain something for 10 pages that you couldn't sustain for 300 pages. Mm -hmm. So partly that could be like experimental stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I have, you know, I have stories in here that, you know, there's, I have one story in here that's a photograph and then it goes forward and backward in time from the moment the photograph was taken. And if I maintain that for 300 pages, um, you'd be ill. Um, <laughs> like no one would read that. And, um, but I can do it for five or six pages. But I think that, yeah, probably, like, you don't have to worry about marketability. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can do, I, like, now knowing what I know now, I hope it doesn't really get in my way, but about the way novels are received. There is so much of novels being judged by how appropriate and likable the female main characters are mm -hmm. that goes on online. Like, oh, she made some bad decisions, so one star for this book. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> do you really want to read a book where everyone makes great decisions all the time? Um, I mean, it's like my first novel was about someone who kidnapped a child. So she made some like really egregiously bad decisions. So I'm getting this maybe more than some people, but um, but still, um, so, yeah, you know. And then it's like in a, in a story, no one cares. And I think it's because short stories just have a more self-selective readership. Mm -hmm. I think that's a lot of it. I agree. You guys are all really smart for being here. Mm -hmm. So we're right. saying smart and literary, good taste. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Willing to take chances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Should we open things up? Should we? Sure. We can still ask each other questions too, especially if they don't have any. But they, they look like people with questions. <laughs> if the two of you are friends, if you've known each other before, or if tonight's a one night stand. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, well, what's our happening first later? One night stand was a while back. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we've been to each other's homes. And, yeah, our um, kids have played together. Mm -hmm. it's, we met. Um, it gets, it's kind of wonderful the ways that writers' lives intersect. I think, especially now in this mm -hmm. era that um, we were both brought in to do a reading at Franklin and Marshall College. They, have, they bring in looks like five or six of us mm -hmm. um, writers to work with their students and um, to give readings and stuff. And then you're just hanging out and having dinner together every mm -hmm. night. And, mm -hmm. um, but then since I'm here in the summer and our kids have, my kids are really sad that they haven't seen your kids this oh, summer, I actually. Well, I tell them next summer. Yeah. Well. <laughs> 
<laughs> Last time she was there, my kids ran naked through the garden. I think. <laughs> Isn't that true? I think that's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Cool. it's cool. Little feral. Oh. Um, but but we do know each other. Yeah. It's um it's interesting being I I know that I am always interested in other mothers who are working writers. So I think I probably asked you a lot of questions when we were at Franklin and Marshall. Yeah, so my kids are slightly were older. Really younger, yeah. and I would say, how do you do it? Um, it was important to me to get a sense of. I mean, it's hard. It's a yeah. Well, I remember too, like in, in college, someone blithely, like some professor blithely pointed out that like no successful women writers were ever mothers. And I think she was looking back at like the 19th century. So, like her, she wasn't really contemporary in her reading maybe because mm -hmm. that's, you know, it was a college professor. And I was like, oh, I guess that's kind of the way it is. And it's a not even true. You can totally go back and find exceptions to the rule, but it was. It was. And now, not only I think are more, you know, like women who write are often mothers, but like the men I know who write are very often very involved fathers in a way that 80 years ago they might have been quite absentee and taking off and like writing in the Riviera for five months mm -hmm. and the woman did, you know, and you know, I know writers, you know, male writers with who are, you know, doing the childcare because mm -hmm. they're the one with the stay at home job. So I think it's changed on all fronts it too. Seems that way. Yeah. 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 I had the same same panic. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little scary. <laughs> yes. I have a question for Megan. Um, Megan, how did you find the women that you wrote about in your book? Wait, are they all are they all real women? They are real women. Yes. Except for one story, which is a rewrite of Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, which McSweeney's magazine mm -hmm. asked me to do for a cover story issue where they have writers cover famous short stories. It's like doing a cover version of a song, essentially. Um, so that's the only one that, and I you know, and I live in Bennington where Shirley Jackson lived, which is why they asked me to do that. Um, but the rest of them are, and I had basically obsessed over these women for a decade before ever giving myself permission to write a book. I think I was writing a book in my imagination before admitting it to myself. And I happened to be teaching a class um, on memoir to students at Bennington, and I was teaching Henry James' essay, The Art of Fiction, and he talks about how all novelists need freedom. And I essentially gave myself permission that year um, to write this book, but I felt at first strange working with real people, but many of these women were people that, where there wasn't much known, so to engage with them at all in history was to engage your imagination because you only have snippets. A lot of them are just footnotes in other people's biographies. So to that effect, and also I'm a total nerd. Like I <laughs> approach this as an academic and a writer and a woman. Um, I try not to write with a feminist agenda. I am an outright feminist. But I think really agenda and idea-driven books, I think you always have to keep the, the narrative in front of the idea. The narrative has to be more important. So I tried to keep that in mind, and I tried to think about the rule they give biographers, which is not to romanticize and fall in love with your subjects. So I, I really tried to let these women be ugly and gritty, because to me that, I didn't want to infantilize their decisions. They took risks knowing they probably wouldn't pay off, and I wanted to honor that. Um, so that was something I, I worked through, but it, it took me many years to go from thinking about these women to actually writing about them. That's, I found myself, like, I, I, there's another question out there, but I was just to say, like, I, I found myself with my second novel writing out someone historical because I felt like I couldn't make decisions for her. Right. Like, how do you, you know, like, mm -hmm. are, are you letting yourself go off script with what actually happened in some cases, or are you trying to, to stay with, like... believable based yeah. on what I knew. I would lose two hours researching the right brand of lipstick. <laughs> 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 or what a particular <laughs> perfume bottle looks like. Um, but then occasionally I gave myself... I had read so much and researched so much about these women and the era in which they lived that I felt like I was conjuring, like I had that sense. It sounds a little ridiculous, but I, you know, I, I tried to make it as authentic and believable as possible, but I did take liberties, but I, dangerously so. Like I felt, yeah. I have a really long author's note. Oh, that, that so makes up for everything, right, though. Like, you can, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Do you have a question over there? Is that I just had a, I had a comment that I was fascinated with how different everybody's voice was. It was great. Oh, and thank really, you. Really, really nicely done. Thank you. And it's the first time I've gone <laughs> back to reading short stories. I have to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> but then I just read something, and it was a novel, but it was a, a connecting group of short stories mm -hmm. um, that was fascinating. Mm -hmm. Louisa Meets Bear. Have you 
Oh yeah, her? I'm reading that right now. I just did a reading with I her in it. Lisa Gornick. I just yeah. did a reading with her in DC. Yeah. And it's it's yeah, it's really cool. It's, yeah. And so in that case, like, got me turned on to short stories. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we lure them in. <laughs> Yeah, mine, I mean, the, the, the title being Music for Wartime, that's basically, those are the themes of the book, are music or the other, and the other arts, and wartime or other conflicts. But basically, the stories ask the question of what it means to be an artist or to try to make beauty or order mm -hmm. out of a brutal and chaotic world. Oh, so, um, like, the, you know, the story that I was reading to you from, it's about the visual arts rather than music. But um, in the war in question would be the AIDS crisis in here, whereas in other places it's much more literal. I have in the first kind of full-length story, there's a, a pianist who's been sort of jailed in Ceausescu's Romania for you know, a decade and then has been released and is giving his first concert out of jail. Um, so the, the music and the wartime are much more literal there, but in some way or other, they basically all circle around that same question. Um, and, you know, so they, I, th I think that helps with the story collection so much to have something, because I feel like one of the reasons short story collections don't sell as well is they're hard to talk about, and it's hard to describe to your friends or to your book group. Like, we're going to read this book, it's about this, and with a novel, you can sort of give them the hook. Mm -hmm. um, like, I felt like with my, like, my first novel, I had this really great hook. It's about this woman who, this librarian who accidentally kidnaps this child, and that was all you would need to say, and people were, like, either interested or not. And with a story collection, like, well, there's 17 stories, and they're all about different things, and I don't really know how to describe it to you. And someone's, you know, pitching it to their book club. Like, I just read this great book. We should read it. It's about 17 different things. I found <laughs> and a real difference. My first book, Birds of a Lesser Paradise, was very rural-minded, but it was 12 distinct stories. And people would say, what's it about? And I would, I yeah. would freeze. My husband would practice in the car be like, pitch me your book. <laughs> I work it, and I would go. I would usually babble for a second and then go, you wouldn't like it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten a little better. It's much easier to, um, to talk about yeah, it. As yeah. a, it has an angle, it has a very clear reason for being. Um, although sometimes I think anything that's too thematically heavy isn't as elegant. So there's the, no. there's a sort of, there's a delicate balance that an author has to walk. I think yeah. I'm really wary, and it can be done so well, but I'm really wary of linked stories where you're like, you wrote these stories totally separately and you just changed all their name to be the same person. <laughs> this is not actually. Um, but not about seeing the themes or seeing the work. It should appear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are ones that are pretty tightly, mm -hmm. you know, tightly woven. Yes? I'm remembering a few years ago getting a short story by Alice Monroe out of the New Yorker, teaching it, and then the collection came out, and I thought, she's changed it. <laughs> so I'm wondering, and I heard in the introduction that you've both published in many different places, do you use things like Harper's, you know, to test out stories that you were working on for larger collections, or how does that? I think just time is the test more than the publication. It's not like you're getting, you're not getting feedback really from the publication even in a place like Harper's or, you know, like, people aren't really, you might get a random email, but no one's, like, giving you feedback on it, thank God. Um, <laughs> I think it's usually the random hate mail. Yeah, right. <laughs> you should have done this. Um, it's more like time, you know, like, you're looking at something you published. In my case, the oldest story is in here. I wrote in, the oldest story in here was written in 2002. So there's no way I'm looking at that and going, yeah, I totally stand behind that story. It's going in unchanged. <laughs> like, I'm a much different writer and person. And so maybe a third of the text is the same at this point. Um, even when I go back and read my first book, which I can't even bear to do now, um, yeah, no. I was telling someone recently it has a place and a time for me, but I, I can't read it without editing. And I've heard of yeah. famous poets who used to go into libraries and open up a hard copy <laughs> <laughs> and find edits. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's compulsion. I think yeah. it's hard for us to ever feel that something is finished. I'm a little more wary of actually certitude and um, swagger about a finished product. But um, yeah. there are moments when you, I have a few stories that I feel like, yeah, I got it. I really got it there. Um, but I, I do love publishing in journals. Mm -hmm. For, I love I love that culture. I love short fiction. That literary culture is sort of a sinking ship. Sometimes those journals work so hard to stay afloat, um, and I love supporting them. I read for some of them for free. Um, judge short story contests, that sort of yeah. thing. But it's a for short story writers. We need we need those journals and we need that yeah. market and those readers.
Yeah, because it's also like it's what can build your career too. Like for me, you know, I was publishing these short stories, and then, I mean, I was gonna. Here's what happened: I had a baby, and I'd published three short, three short stories, th two or three short stories, and I had a baby. And I'm sure I would have gotten back to writing, but it was like overwhelming. Like I'm never gonna write again. This is ridiculous. This is crazy. And I was teaching full time, and you know. It, um, it was, I was ready to kind of put it on the back burner. And then I got an email from Best American Short Stories that Salman Rushdie had picked the story. For, I mean, it was like, um, and that, you know, I was like, okay, I gotta get a website up, I gotta keep writing, I gotta find a babysitter, I got, you know, um, like, we're, I'm gonna do this now. And um, so be, beyond the fact, like, it introduced my work to a larger audience, I was able to approach my agent ultimately when I was looking for an agent and like have those credentials so I wasn't just a random email describing a book but I had a track record but um, I had the same uh, when I had a story selected for Best American yeah we were in the, it's, we're in the it's same a big edition. game changer because it elevates from that small journal culture to a more widely read yeah, publication yeah like people buy it for yeah. Christmas yeah. for each other yeah. and stuff yeah and yeah and mm -hmm. being able to um, I don't know if that was before or after you had your agent for me it was before the first I couple of I like, remember but you know, to that. Around the same time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, but if, if nothing else, it, you know, there's that. And then there was just the, like, the public recognition and the, oh my God, I should keep going. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think suddenly for the first time, rather than making like $100 for a short story, I made $750. And it was like, I could live off this. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> off my $750. <laughs> <laughs> I love hearing about like the Halcyon days of like, Cheever writing a story a week oh. and selling it and like keeping his family afloat. Oh yeah, I, you could never make. Oh, a like Fitz, on Fitzgerald short would short like fiction. would like slum it by writing short yeah. fiction. Yeah, that he would like he need to earn some money, so he'd write a story for like the Saturday Evening Post, and they'd pay him something like three thousand dollars in 1925 money. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Right. And the same Vincent Millay wrote a lot of short stories under a pen name Nancy Boyd. Really. For the same thing mm -hmm, to finance her first trip to Europe. As one does. Yes, one does. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Like I know, yeah. not happening now. No, yeah. no. No, like the very I mean the very best. I mean there's the New Yorker pays more right. than like, you know, the Iowa Review or whatever, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. The Iowa Review is paying like two hundred bucks, and yeah. the, you know you get. It still you know, feels good when that check comes. I in. know. I probably like, should. Have, yeah. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It feels good. And then you actually th figure out how much you make per hour, mm -hmm. and then like you pay the babysitter. No, I've never, I've and never like, that out. <laughs> I, my babysitting costs. I don't think I've. Yeah. I don't think I'm getting a return on investment yet. Yeah, not particularly. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Maybe. Other questions out there? Yeah. Stories. Yeah. So if you know, so um, if you know anything about, like, you know, I think the the other thing beyond the like music and wartime theme, the other thing that is sort of the hook on this book is that um, I um, I have a really bizarre family history in Hungary in the 1930s and and beyond that. And um, what I what I've done is there are four stories in here that are directly about my family. Um, that are, three of them are subtitled legends, um, that they're basically, it's, it's sort of, I think of it as overtly fictionalized nonfiction. So I'm taking the family story that I was given. Like there's a story about my grandmother. Um, she'd been an actress and then she became an, she's an author. She's like, a, um, a, she wrote like 40 novels, which is really intimidating actually. Um, but she, in Hungarian, which I can't read, so it's not that intimidating because I don't ever need to deal with them. But, um, but she had all this stage makeup left from when she was an actress and she was working for the resistance and she would paint these young women's faces to make them look old um, so that they could work for the resistance and basically not get raped in the streets at night. So um, I've been, I was told the story throughout my childhood and from like high school on I was trying to write this story and make something of it. And um, seriously, I, I have a college friend in the audience who probably saw a draft of this story in like 1997. <laughs> um, and um, so basically what I was finally doing was, was just acknowledging this is the story I was told and I don't know the truth and I don't, I'm not able to really represent it, but here's what I kind of imagine happening. And, um, and they, there are really lovely parts to my family history. Like my grandmother was this amazing person um, and fought for the resistance and did all this really cool stuff. My grandfather um, 
I, I try to say this as much as I can so that just I get used to saying it, but he was the author of the second set of anti-Jewish laws in Hungary in the 1930s. Um, and he was a member of parliament. He was also the editor of the newspaper, kind of conflict of interest, um, very young actually. But he, um, he then later turned and fought for the resistance and I'm never quite able to figure out why and what mm -hmm. happened. Um, but, um, and they, and the marriage parents were only married to each other for like a year. Um, it's, it's absolutely bizarre. I don't quite know how to sort it out. And it's the, basically, I'm going to be writing a nonfiction book about them in the near future. I need to, um, my father just moved back to Hungary, so I'm going to be getting over there a lot and hopefully researching their lives. But it's really complicated. I knew my grandfather later as a yoga instructor who lived in Hawaii. <laughs> and um, I'm having this really hard time reconciling all of this. So I feel like I've sort of been given the stuff that I need to write about. And it, this was sort of dipping my toe in the water. Um, and then there are other stories in here that relate to those stories in a way that, you know, just um, like the last story in the collection, there's this sort of old Hungarian couple living in this apartment building in Chicago. It's complete fiction, but if you've read all the way through, you basically understand them to be students for my grandparents and my trap trying to grapple with who they were and what on earth was going on with their lives. So, so uh, apart from your uh, project that you want to do a nonfiction thing, wh why did you not, in this book anyway, um, say to yourself, well, I'm a fiction writer, I can take their story and do what I want with it. Yeah, I mean, I did in some of them, basically. Like, the, I think there are stories, um, like the, the last story in the collection is called The Museum of the Dearly Departed, and I've completely changed things. It's this couple where um, I made, I, I put them on even further on opposite sides of history. Um, and I wrote a work of complete fiction and um, put them in this apartment building that had had a gas leak and the woman thinks the gas is coming back for them after all these years. And it's very much about my family, but it's complete fiction. Um, but then I felt like I wanted to put the nonfiction in there too, um, or the, the nonfiction, um, that um, it's kind of in conversation with those stories and um, I felt like it, you know, it, it made this something different than a story collection. It, it you know, it, it makes it almost a sort of a meta story collection where you're reading the stories, but also thinking about why I, as an author, would be drawn to write these stories and what it is that I'm trying to reconcile in my own mm -hmm. mind. And I feel like, you know, like, uh, you know, when you writing fiction, I feel like is a lot like dreaming, where you're working out stuff in your subconscious, and it's your job as a writer, not just to work that stuff out, but then to, to figure out what it is you were trying to say. You, know, you sit down and write the story a little bit blindly the first time, and then you have the job of interpreting it yourself in order to finish it and revise it the way you would interpret your dream when you wake up. And I think I'm just trying to do that a little bit more overtly, maybe in this case. I just I have a question yeah. about, I mean, I understand the whole thing with the resistance, and I'm thinking, is it the same reason that we don't know the full stories of what went on with my husband's parents? Did they not talk about it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And especially, you know, my, my father was very young and then grew up in communist Hungary, which, you know, for him to survive yeah. in that school system and with, you know, he had to completely um, rewrite his family history and, and um, come up with a much more presentable version of it. And I get all my information from him. Um, and he was like three when all this yeah. stuff happened yeah. and um, isn't the most reliable source. Right. So... That's my, yeah. My husband wasn't even born, but he was born right after the war. Yeah. The little pieces here and there that they talked about, and my son, who works here, <laughs> was talking to you originally. Um, oh, yeah. He wants to write about his grandparents, but he's going to have to do that same yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel I mean I'm in a really unusual position that there's a lot of historical record on my grandparents. Yeah. Um, which means. On the, on, you know, the good news is it means I'm going to be able to find this stuff out, and the bad news is I'm going to be able to find this stuff yeah. out. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. I was just curious about uh, was it Bergen Belson that you were mm -hmm. writing about? Mm -hmm. um, was it a particular woman you saw in a picture, or what in spot? Whose voice is that, do you mm -hmm. think? Collectively, I was thinking of the group of women, and there are pictures of them um, from that liberation, um, but one of the, I wish I could show it alongside the story, but the street artist Banksy um, has a piece of art directly related to that quote about the lipsticks. So wow. It's a classic picture of an, an, a female internee with hot pink mm -hmm. lipstick over the black and white photo. It's really compelling. And when I think about the function of art 
and I see that piece, I thought, what is the literary kind of equivalent to that? Um, so I, was, I often think about, in cross-genre ways, um, my story about Lucia Joyce, who was James Joyce's daughter. She was a, a modern dancer and possible schizophrenic and had synesthesia and never had a native tongue. So she spoke three different languages, but she never grew up knowing one as her native tongue. And so because she arranged sentences so strangely, she and her father had a very <coughs> um, fraught relationship, but he took a lot of direct inspiration from the way that she spoke. Um, wow. And I had a friend who's a choreographer put my story to dance, mm -hmm. but I, I love, I really love the relationship of other arts. Um, I can point to a lot of them that, that link back up to this collection. I was teaching when I wrote this collection at Bennington, and Bennington is such a make art kind of culture, if you know anything about it. It's many other things as well. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I, I think I was inspired that way. But if you look up that Banksy piece, that's, that's so really, cool. mm -hmm, that's part of it. You know, there's a theory that Banksy is a collective of women. I didn't which, know that theory. But yeah, I, I love it. right. <laughs> that kind of like makes me. Yeah. That's I feel like that's evidence in that corner yeah. that you do that. Yeah. yeah. I, I you know in my mind now mm -hmm. Banksy is. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna jump on that ship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you face any criticism about like cultural appropriation with that, like the way you know Carolyn Forche did with the Colonel poem, mm -hmm. for instance? I really feared it. Um, I have. I didn't want this to be almost famous straight women or almost famous white women, <laughs> so I tried to make it a diverse collection. But when you do that, you you are appropriating in some ways. Um, if I ever feel like I'm, if I can't crack it, empathetically, um, I try to write in third person. Um, there's some women that I felt a direct relation to. So I wrote about Joe Carstairs, who was a Standard Oil heiress who was, this is her driving one of her boats that she helped design. She was the fastest woman on water. She had tattoos up her arms, got her marriage annulled 14 days later so she could have her enormous inheritance. Um, <laughs> bought an island um, in the Bahamas during, in between the wars and ruled it like a tyrant. I could what? not get inside her head. <laughs> who had infinite resources and agency. But I could imagine um, one of the girlfriend's hundreds that she bust on and off the island coming from a small southern town and being bewildered by this woman's intensity. So the story is written from that perspective, a woman plucked from one of the mermaid tanks in Sarasota, Florida, a mm -hmm. um, small town girl <coughs> exposed to something bigger. That's usually how I approach something like that. Um, there's a story about the painter Romaine Brooks, who's written from a servant's perspective. I have a story about Norma Millay, who was Edna St. Vincent Millay's sister, sort of second oh, yeah. fiddle, but was a very talented modernist She's actress. The one who haunts Millay Colony. She does. <laughs> She's really amazing. Um, and yeah, so I, I, there are times where I knew that I couldn't crack it entirely, so how could I still illuminate it, but in a way that felt more authentic to me and the way that my imagination could kind of root there? So those are some of the ways I approached it. Cool. Can maybe do one last question? That's, uh, or we could ask each other one last question. What's your next project, girls? That's a good, that's yeah, a good last yeah, one. That's a good one. You go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I am working, so I'm working on, I'm kind of working on three things. I'm always writing short stories, and I kind of have my eye on the next collection, but I think that's going to be a couple books out. Um, I'm working on a novel that is actually related a lot to the story I was reading to you tonight that's set partly in the 1980s but in Chicago um, with the backdrop of the AIDS epidemic and partly in modern day Paris where there's a woman who's a survivor of that scene um, is traveling there to reconnect with her estranged daughter. Um, so I'm working on that um, but I'm also then working on this thing about my family and I don't I have no idea how long that's going to take me, if it's going to be like a 20-year project or a two-year project. I don't know what I'm getting into. So I'm trying to anchor myself in, you know, just plugging on with the novel because I know that I can do that, you know, in, in a reasonable amount of time and then I'll, I'll get the other stuff done too. Um, the next story collection is like, you know, it's like I'm, I'm thinking of like the themes and the mm -hmm. links and everything and I think it's called Occupational Hazards. I think that's what it's going to be called, like but it's, it's a few years out. So. Mm -hmm. Like Rebecca, I'm uh, spinning about four yeah. plates at once. I have a novel under contract that I'm trying to finish up called The Houseboat about um, a sort of B-level opera singer just past her prime whose mother was a concert pianist and had a missing year. Um, it take, takes place partly in Savannah. And 
I'm also working on a future short story collection and also possibly a nonfiction project. I studied anthropology in undergrad and I'm really fascinated. I'm sort of a thwarted primatologist. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really interested in um, inhibition and primates and humans and midlife crises and that sort cool. of fun stuff. Yeah, why not, right? <laughs> wow, so be nonfiction? Yeah. yeah, but I don't, I, I don't know if you've ever had this feeling, but I, I have some material, but I may not be ready to write it, yeah. you know? There, yeah. There's some things that percolate that I think really benefit from think time and practice and increase skill. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, there was a story, and I'm not even gonna say what it was, there was, uh, my dad's a poet, mm -hmm. and so like thinks this way, and I, I, when I was in college, I think I told him this idea for a, a story I wanted to write, and he said, that's a great idea, do me a favor and don't write it till you're 30. <laughs> I and get that. then I turned 30 and it like mm -hmm. it, it was in my mind. I was like, I'm turning 30. I was like, I should write the story now. And I'm like, no way. I'm not gonna write it until I'm like 60. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> we'll totally see. Fair. Anyway. Thank you guys. Thank for you guys. Out. Yeah. <laughs>